thank you, sir. May I share? Yes. I uh, hope my screen is visible and I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my acknowledgements to the organizers of Best of ISPAD. It has been a wonderful idea right from the start when Dr. Banshi Sabu had uh, discussed it uh, during the ISPAD 2022 at Abu Dhabi itself. And uh, thank you, organizers, and especially Dr. Banshi Sabu for spreading the awareness of childhood diabetes. My acknowledgements to Professor Linda DiMaglio and Lordana Mokovicchio. They had presented these guidelines in the conference. And uh, they very gladly uh, gave over the slides so that uh, I can use it, um, which I have definitely adapted it to for presentation to our Indian subcontinent. And Professor Maria Craig and the entire team, and the then ISPAD president, Dr. Kareem, who now for nominating me to present this. I think it has been my good fortune that I was selected to be a project officer for the ISPAD 2022 guidelines. This is an entire editorial team. And just to tell you that the planning process started as far back as 2019 and 2020. 25 chapters were um, included in that. The um, technology was divided into glycemic and monitoring and insulin delivery as two separate chapters. Uh, for the first time, uh, there were more than 250 authors involved in the entire process. Each author, apart from the editors, was allowed to be in only one chapter so that uh, a lot of authors and a lot of opinions can be invited together. At least one author was, yeah, an effort was made that at least one author was there from the developing countries in each chapter. And at least one person with diabetes or a parent of a child with diabetes or a, pa or a patient advocacy person was there. More than 55 countries were involved globally with a mix of early career, mid career, and senior clinicians. Just to give a perspective that a lot of effort was gone into screening the authors, so to uh, have a very good um, practical guidelines. There was a lot of, was a huge process of literature search, evidence review, evidence grading was again reviewed. There was a coordination and help in the making of chapters. There was a guest review, there was an expand forum review, and they're almost over now, and they are for, in, in the process of publication in the pediatric diabetes, and some are already published. And a good news for everyone now that this will also be available as freely downloadable in the ISPAD website as like the 2018 guidelines. Uh, so, um, as we said, 25 chapters in 25 minutes, and I will try to do my best to do that. But in case I really go overboard, organizers, please interrupt me. This was the evidence grading, the AD evidence grading, which was used previously as well. A means clear evidence from well-conducted randomized control trials. B is supportive evidence from well-conducted cohort studies. C is poorly controlled and uncontrolled studies. And E is expert consensus guidelines, expert consensus or clinical experience. So what's new? I think the important thing, so I would be discussing the general that language mark matters, individualized management was given a lot of importance. Uh, diagnosis and screening of type 1 diabetes, uh, the glycemic targets, DK and hypoglycemia management, complication and comorbidities. I will keep it very brief, all these topics, just to give an idea of what is there. And obviously, we will all have to go back to the chapters to find that out in details. So, language matters was something which was given uh, huge importance by the editorial team because we knew that that is the most powerful drug used by mankind. For example, there is no uh, use of patient in the guidelines. It is a person with diabetes. There is, it is, there is nothing called control. There are stable glucose, suboptimal levels, or in the optimal range. Should, should not count, must. These are very situation-specific. So, uh, and these have to be used carefully. For example, treating this patient um, is, was not preferred. It was like managing the diabetes, and it was not called a disease. It was called a condition. Many things are there. There were a lot of lot of papers also which are available now regarding language uh, matters in diabetes. And I, um, we all see that these should be incorporated more into more into, into practice, and it really helps the family manage it better. 
So the criteria for diagnosing diabetes remains the same. Lab measurement, random blood sugar more than 200 or fasting more than 126 or two hours OGTT more than 200 or HP1C of more than 6.5%. The chapter further goes on to say the details of how much fasting, what is the OGTT uh, specifications, and what are the HPA1C specifications. In the absence of overt symptoms, two abnormal test results from the same sample, or in two separate test samples. In the absence of unequivocal hypoglycemia, we may see it more and more often because we are uh, looking towards screening, generalized screening, and population and targeted screening. So continued observation and or OGTT or SMBG, HPA1C and CGM use if OGTT is not feasible. Stages of type 1 diabetes has recently come into a big focus as Cetlizumab was FDA approved for uh, dealing the onset of clinical diabetes. So stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3 are something which are uh, very known by to, to the August audience by now. So stage 1 is Normal blood sugar, outer antibodies, more than at least two outer antibodies present. Stage 2 is when the OGTD is abnormal. And stage 3 is a clinical diagnosis of more than a clinical diagnosis with outer antibodies present. Now, um, this chapter further uh, goes on to say that 80 to 90 percent of children with multiple eye outer antibodies will progress to clinical diagnosis within 15 years. And nearly 100% of children with multiple autoantibodies will ultimately progress to stage 3 type 1 diabetes. This was as previously told by Dr. Mohan and other people as well in the inaugural that type 1 diabetes starts from childhood. But as so, as of someone who has child, uh, type 1 diabetes in childhood will continue to remain have childhood, um, have type 1 diabetes. So this is as much a concern of adult diabetologists and not only the pediatric diabetologists. Apart from that, more and more type 1 diabetes are also being seen in adults, and this will we have to keep it, take into account. Screening, so targeted screening and follow-up has been shown to reduce BPA, reduce the rates of hospitalization, and directs individuals towards studies, seeking to delay or prevent ongoing beta cell loss. The A, B, C, and E in capital and gold are the evidence grades. General population screening programs using combinations of genetic and autoantibody testing can identify high-risk children. Screening should be coupled with education and monitoring programs. If we screen and do nothing about it, there is absolutely no point. The progression rates are similar between individuals with a family history of type 1 diabetes and without family history. And autoantibody screening at ages 2 and 6 years may provide for optimal sensitivity and positive predictive value in public health settings. Now, a lot of people might think that, of course, we have a screening. And is it um, cost effective? Is it, is it feasible? Well, as we all know that in India, we have diverse populations. A family might then come and say, my, my first child has type 1 diabetes. Should we screen for the second child? So this could be a targeted screening and should we go for it? What should we do? When should we check? And these will give us some guidelines. An important update in these 2022 guidelines, would I would say, is the glycemic targets, the beautiful, colorful diagram figure which has been presented in the chapter. And we have proposed a unified target instead of three meals, four meals, bedtime, and the different kinds of uh, things they have just presented as a unified target of 70 to 180 and a type of fasting target of 70 to 144. This 144 comes because when you convert 8 millimoles to milligrams per deciliter, it comes like that. But roughly, probably we can say 70 to 140. So this is, so I think they found it, um, they changed it because uh, it is, it is probably much more easier to remember such values than have different different individualized values. And it was seen that the 70 to 180 gives is an equivalent of more than 70% um, time in range for uh, effective for an optimal HbA1c, an optimal time in one time in range, and hence this has been unified target. So this beautiful figure shows 70 to 180 as milligram per deciliter as the glycemic target. Target HPA1C should be less than 7% with evidence grade of A. So 6 to 7% is what uh, has been shown in this figure. 
This is your blood glucose in milligram per deciliter, blood glucose in millimoles per liter. This is the HbA1c. This is the HP, the glycemia in IFCC millimoles per, per mole. This is the CGM targets, and this has all been individualized and it's easy to put up in the clinics. SMDG has been requested to do at least six times a day. And the most important thing is there, there should be individualized care plans. Some settings in which HbA1c can be less than or equal to 6.5%. So only if there is access to advanced technology and there is a highly skilled healthcare professional who knows, who knows how to um, manage this advanced technology and train them. It was interesting to see that they have put that even the preschool type 1 diabetes child can achieve HbA1c of less than 6.5% without a high risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, if there is access to high quality diabetes care, including modern technology. Previously, we would be very worried that HbA1c is low, so there must be a lot of hypoglycemia going on, provided there is a lot of CGM use, provided there is technology use. It has been seen it is possible without a high risk of hypoglycemia. Type 2 diabetes, target is less than 7%, and in most cases can be less than 6.5% as well. In CFRD, HbA1c goals is less than 7% and less stringent goals of significant or repeated hypoglycemia. So importance has been given that stringent targets only if someone uses advanced technology to the optimal. And if there are hypoglycemia, then preventing hypoglycemia takes a precedence over a lower A1c. Coming to DKA, there was a significant change in the definition where previously it all used to be less than 15 millimoles per liter of bicarb. Here it has been changed less than 18 millimoles per liter of bicarb to diagnose DKA, the mild variety. And the, based on a 2015 study, it has been seen that if we take a cutoff of 18 millimoles per liter, then the pickup, the sensitivity of the investigation is higher and we pick up more cases of diabetic ketoacidosis. And otherwise, the criteria remains the same. Similarly, the resolution of ketoacidosis has also been taken as 18. Important uh, uh, in the DK chapter is that instead of cerebral edema, the word has been replaced by cerebral injury. So as it has been seen, the cerebral hypoperfusion and the hyperinflammatory stage causing cerebral injury uh, is, a, is a central figure. It correlates with the degree of dehydration and hyperventilation presentation, but not with the initial osmolality or the osmotic changes during treatment. With this, major changes in the fluids were, were advocated. For example, uh, this means the same fluid replacement should begin before insulin. Initial fluid boluses over 20 to 30 minutes, so you can give an actual bolus instead of previously told over as one hour. And you can replace the estimated fluid deficit faster over 24 to 48 hours as against previous of 36 to 48 hours. Fluid volume and content, for example, how much of fluid volume you want to give, whether it is N by 2 saline, whether it is NS, can be adjusted to the clinical scenario. A lot of freedom has been given to use the clinical judgment in deciding how much sodium is required, how much of fluid is required. In the sodium, a lot of different types of fluids have been advocated based on the requirement. It can be half N by 2 saline, it can be normal saline, it can be ringless lactate, Hartman solution, plasma light. And it should depend on clinician judgment based on the child's hydration status, serum sodium concentration, and osmolality. Promoting a rise in serum sodium concentrations during the DK treatment did not be a team focus. And a fall in sodium also may not be ominous. So a lot of importance has to be, have been given to the clinical scenarios. If required, if we want to change the serum, if there is a change required for the serum sodium, change the sodium content of the IV fluid and not the rate of, rate of fluid infusion. Insulin, a lot, of, a lot more studies have come out for a lower dose of insulin. So 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour at least one hour after starting the fluid replacement therapy and potassium infusion to begin when potassium is less than 5.5 millimoles per liter. There are many other small, small, small changes and it is a very beautiful chapter to read and um, it is uh, it, uh, it, it will be available soon on the ISPAD website free. 
I'm sure most of you would have downloaded it when it was put it put up on the SPAD forum for review by members. If anyone wants it, I can always share it. In the hypoglycemia, the threshold remains the same. Alert at less than 70, free with hypoglycemia at less than 54. They have given acceptable time limit. So less than 54 is, is one person or less than 15 minutes per day is acceptable for clinically serious hypoglycemias. So currently available technologies like CGM, automated insulin suspensions, hybrid closed loop systems have reduced the duration of hypoglycemia. And more and more, you will see technology woven throughout the chapters in all the chapters. And uh, we should try as far as possible uh, to try and, and include it in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, in the hypoglycemia management, the new glucagon formulations, they may not be available in India, but uh, efforts have to be made and it's good to know about them. So subcutaneous IM glucagon, one milligram per kg, one milligram for children more than 25 kilos, 0.5 milligram for children less than 25 kilos, and the newer formulations are stable liquid glucagon, a uh, nasal glucagon preparation, and a stable glucagon analog as a ready to use pen, which uh, possibly may be soon available in the country. We'll have to look into that. Next, coming to complication screening. So, frequency of retinopathy screening has been changed to two to three years. Previously, it was biennial. It was told to check every two years. Now, based on how your initial retinopathy screen is, you may defer it to two to three years. The nephropathy criteria has been updated, where previously the values were different for males and females. Now, the ACR threshold is similar for both males and females as 30 milligrams per gram. EGFR monitoring has been included as another approach to monitoring of nephropathy. Uh, for type, uh, so it's complication screening, this table, I've taken it from the chapter and added two tables in which both in all nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy, macrovascular disease, the in type 1 diabetes at puberty or 11 years, with 2 to 5 years of diabetes duration, and for type 2 diabetes at diagnosis. So the important to remember is if you have a child with type 2 diabetes, all the screening should begin at diagnosis. If it is type 1 diabetes at puberty or 11 years with 2 to 5 years of diabetes duration, screening methods we discussed, urinary ACR confirmed with first morning urine sample and two of three urine samples over a three to six month period. And it has to be repeated annually. Very clearly it has been written that rule out non-diabetic CKD, optimize glycemia, optimize blood pressure, and then consider use of drugs like these inhibitors or ARBs. In retinopathy, fundus photography or dilated pupil examination, Examination of fundus through dilated pupils and every two to three years and prompt referral for treatment. Neuropathy is based on history, physical examination, clinical tests to be done annually. BP has to be checked at least annually, ideally at every clinic visit and lipid panel every three years. So initial management with diet, exercise, optimizing glycemia and statins can be used more than 10 years of age. There has been, uh, I thought there was a significant change in the celiac disease screening. So initial year of diabetes diagnosis and at two to five year intervals, the celiac disease screening has been advocated. Uh, they have also said, consider if a child is asymptomatic, if we feel that family will have a challenge in managing new onset type of diabetes, plus a diagnosis of celiac disease and the child is asymptomatic, then we may use our judgment to maybe check for celiac disease. After the type 1 diabetes, the diet part of type 1 diabetes has settled a bit. And so consider initial screening after initial post-diagnosis period. If more frequent assessment for celiac disease, more than every two to five years, if there are symptoms, obviously, and if child has a first degree relative with celiac disease. There are some changes in the biopsy recommendations. A serology-based diagnostic approach has been used. Um, if it is an asymptomatic child, diagnosis is presumed. Of course, we have to do an IgA and see it is normal. If the TTG IgA is more than 10 times the upper limit of TTG IgA assay, and there is a positive EM, EMA endomycelial antibody IgA in a second sample, while on a diet containing gluten, 
then it can be a presumed diagnosis of uh, celiac disease. Uh, biopsy would probably be needed uh, if the family goes for it as a diet which has which has to include type 1 diabetes recommendations and has to have a gluten-free diet can be quite challenging if it needs to be followed for a lifetime. In symptomatic children, a biopsy sparing approach may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis in consultation with a pediatric gastroenterologist, the child and family, and there is a resolution of symptoms after initiation of a gluten-free diet. I thought this was a very important um, a screening uh, is there was an important thing where we can avoid biopsy as a lot of families with type 1 diabetes if they have they are symptomatic then they question why do you want us to start the celiac uh, gluten diet if we are happy with a gluten-free diet and we most likely know it is a uh, uh, celiac disease for other comorbidities dsh every two years every one year if antibodies are positive a lot, a lot of a host of autoimmune conditions have been mentioned, but all screening is symptom related. But children, uh, children with type 1 diabetes and celiac disease should have annual screening for TSH and monitoring of vitamin D to optimize bone health. So bone health has been included, included as, an, as an important emerging T1D complication. So uh, counsel regarding the uh, to the family's counsel regarding optimization of calcium and vitamin D intake, regular weight-bearing exercise, and avoiding smoking. Individualized bone health assessments if there are medical comorbidities like celiac disease or a family history of early osteoporosis. Uh, in certain ages like preschoolers, adolescents, it has been very clearly said that therapy is a preferred method wherever the three is available, affordable, and acceptable. So this available, affordable, and acceptable, the three A's have been more or less consistently present in all the chapters, but they have made it a point that if technology is available, then that should be preferred. At least a trial should be given. If pump therapy is not available, multiple daily injections should be used from the time of diagnosis. pre administration of bolus insulin is preferable rather than giving the insulin now, after a meal, so we may give a smaller bolus uh, or bolus insulin before a meal and go for corrections if required, if glucose is high, but definitely a preprandial administration should be advocated. CGM is the recommended method of glucose monitoring. If CGM is not available, at least 7 to 10 blood glucose checks per day is ideally recommended. Coming to technology, as the Jyoti Dev also was telling about technology, Technology is woven throughout the guidelines, CGM especially. So CGM is strongly recommended in all children, adolescents, and young adults with type 1 diabetes with a grade level of A. Where available, CGM should be initiated in all children, adolescents, and young adults as soon as possible after diagnosis. Regular CGM can be used effectively for reaching target A1Cs, reducing glucose variability, increasing time in range and reducing hypoglycemia. For intermittently scanning CGM, which probably is the most used in India, a higher scanning frequency of 11 to 13 scans per day is associated with favorable glycemic markers. So I have taken these points from all the chapters just to give you an idea of how everyone is talking in the same tone. In various settings, CGM has been, has been used in all chapters. In exercise, CGM use during exercise is strongly recommended. In six days, finger stick watch CGM values. So they have in the hypoglycemic chapter also they have written the new factory calibrated CGM um, devices. Uh, they can be used for for managing for management and not only diagnosis of hypoglycemia. In CFRB, because they are more prone to hypoglycemia, CGM use is desirable. In school, the school personnel should know about new diabetes technologies such as CGM devices. In preschool, CGM is a recommended tool for glycemic monitoring in preschoolers. Fasting, use of CGM to facilitate the adjustments of insulin dosing during fasting. Limitations have also been covered quite diligently. In associated complications, there is one whole section devoted to skin issues with pumps and uh, pump attachments and CGM attachments. 
Exercise says that CGM lags during prolonged aerobic exercises and glucose levels need to be confirmed between the stick measurements. Structured initial and ongoing education and training is paramount to success. And setting realistic expectations is paramount to the success. So all these limitations also have been addressed. This is regarding, I thought this would be interesting for people to know, skin related device complications, prevention by good nutrition, hydration, sanitation, product device placement, proper removal technique and prophylactic skin care, skin preparations like exfoliation, trimming the hair, removing oil, appropriately cleaning and drying the skin, uh, using antiperspirants, use adhesive barriers, stacking agents, and maybe off-label steroid sprays like ruticazone prior to insertion of those who have significant issues with CGM placements. Same with insulin delivery. Youth should be offered the most advanced insulin delivery technology that is available, affordable, and appropriate for them. Automated insulin delivery systems, like the one which um, Dr. Yoti have just mentioned now, improve family range and are strongly recommended for youth with diabetes. Complete insulin pumps. So in most of the chapters, this is what is written. Insulin pumps reduce chronic complications of life and diabetes in youth, even when compared to those with similar HPA1Cs on MDI therapy. Limitations have been addressed. It is strongly recommended that diabetes providers and educators implement a standardized training approach when new insulin devices are integrated into care. So no one can do away with a standardized training approach. Training education still remains a very important point, vital point in all aspects of diabetes care. Counsel youth and caregivers about realistic expectations for glycemic outcomes and effort required for successful use. An adjustment period of approximately one month should be anticipated with transition to new devices. And there will be ongoing need for engagement in diabetes management behaviors. Just because someone has put in a pump doesn't mean they don't need to calculate the carb count, they don't need to do the sugar checks and appropriate management with insulin doses. Go online. It can be very easily seen with that we are also going online with these five presentations. That telemedicine offers an important alternative to in-person diabetes review for people who live in remote areas without access to professional services. Youth should, and another important thing which they have mentioned in the adolescent chapter is that youth should be directed towards relevant local peer support groups and made aware of the diabetes online community and diagnosis. It has been seen that if we introduce adolescents to the diabetes online community or introduce them to peer groups, then they are really helped. Technology burden has also been discussed, and it is important to say that technological advances should be tailored to individual wishes and needs, and probably after counseling as required. Diabetes, risk, distress, and mental health has been given great importance. And it has been said that negative emotion or affect experienced by approximately 30% of adolescents with type 1 diabetes, almost one in three adolescents will have a negative emotion. Screening for symptoms of depression, diabetes distress, and disordered eating in children, all children aged 12 and above. Cycling psychosocial care should be integrated. There should be a person centered medical care, individualized medical care to optimize health outcomes and health related quality of life. Type 2 diabetes. The screening things are almost similar after onset of puberty or after 10 years, with PMI more than 85th percentile and risk factors for type 2 diabetes. If all tests are normal, repeat screening at least every three years. Annual screening if there are other factors like increasing BMI, worsening cardiometabolic risk profile, strong family history of type 2 diabetes, or evidence of pre diabetes. And they also lay a lot of importance to clinical assessment of other comorbidities, clinical assessment for hypertension, dyslipidemia, fatty liver disease, PCOS, obstructive sleep apnea, and when we are initially considering screening for type 2 diabetes. Management, diet, and physical activity are all paramount. Apart from that, they have also given importance to sleep. Promote adequate quality sleep of 8 to 11 hours a night according to age or 9 to 11 hours of children for younger age groups. 
the fasting targets in type 2 diabetes 70 to 110 postprandial 70 to 140 and as we discussed a1c is less than 7 percent and can be 6.5 percent in most cases social determinants of health cultural social geographic and economic barriers must ma'am sorry to interrupt but ma'am uh, can you make this a little faster we are yes. running late yeah we are almost done to implementing this thing so this is a nice table which is present regarding use of metformin, insulin and OHA, which is there in the chapter. And this is my last section in which there is a, uh, there is a nice new chapter which has been introduced as uh, management of diabetes in limited resource settings and where they have uh, discussed best possible care when resources are limited. And it is not limited only to one country, but for different places. So data and registry are very important. One important thing which they have advocated all along, the pre-mixed and twice-daily regimens are not suggested for use in type 1 diabetes. Glucose monitoring, how it can be tailored based on the strict survey level has been given. Hypoglycemia management, how it can be improvised based on what is available. Education is paramount. Subpitness, regular insulin uh, for DKA management and all important diabetes education, initial and ongoing, is very important for all caregivers. Psychosocial and social determinants of health, as we have already described. The different levels of care which has been given based on the, the paper by Dr. Graham in the Pediatric Diabetes 2019, and everyone is uh, encouraged to go through these. So to sum it up, the guidelines are for the people and by the people. Suggestions are most welcome, and uh, if, even after the guidelines are have been completed, if we want to have any suggestions, and I'm sure it will be incorporated, and they will discuss it in the next guidelines. Thank you so much.